Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another edition of our fortnightly Irina Insights webinar series. My name is Karun Kocher and I'm joining you from Irina's Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn, Germany. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I would like to introduce Irina and our webinar series. Irina is an intergovernmental organization with currently 168 member countries and another 16 in the accession process. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as a principal platform for international cooperation, a center of excellence, and a repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. And because our analytical work and our engagement with our members generate a lot of valuable insights, we are constantly looking for more ways to share those insights with you. And that is why we launched this webinar series, which we run every other week, usually on Tuesdays. We have organized over 50 webinars of, on various topics, and you can check them all on our IENA events website. The link to that will be in the presentation slides. We understand that there are many deep dive, longer webinars out there, but our aim is to keep these webinars short and sweet, lasting approximately 30 minutes. While we cannot cover everything in this time frame, we hope to give you enough information and more than that, the sources of more in-depth information to help you explore the topic further. Next slide, please. Today, in the next 30 minutes, we will hear from Jack Kiruja, who leads Irina's work on geothermal energy. He will share insights from a joint report between Irina and the International Geothermal Association titled Global Geothermal Market and Technology Assessment. Next slide. But before I hand over the microphone to, to Jack, a few housekeeping items. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the IRINA events website. You are by default on mute, but we encourage you to use the, the Q&A or the chat function to ask any questions. And without any further ado, let me welcome Jack to our Hydrogen Insights webinar series. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Karen, for the introduction. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to be sharing uh, some of the work that um, uh, we have been doing at Irina. And um, I would like to start by mentioning that I'm uh, based uh, at Irina, working, I mean, supporting the work of the, the lands in the field of geothermal energy. And this work is undertaken in the framework of the Global Geothermal Alliance. So um, the Global Geothermal Alliance, we've been able to do uh, quite a number of uh, um, IRENA, IRENA work. And today I'm going to be sharing one of our latest uh, uh, pieces of work on the Global Geothermal Market and Technology Assessment. So this is a report that was developed jointly between IRENA and the International Geothermal Association. Uh, in a, under the umbrella of the Global Geothermal Alliance. And the report uh, seeks to take stock of the geothermal uh, status. Uh, so basically what have been uh, the, the current installed capacity for geothermal electricity and, uh, and, and heat. Just looks at uh, some of the emerging trends that have been taking place uh, recently and how they have uh, influenced the development of geothermal. Uh, and also looking at uh, what are some of the factors that we think are going to drive the geothermal sector in the coming years? So this report uh, takes look, uh, a look at the global status, but also it looks at what's happening in specific regions and uh, particularly in the Asia and Oceania region, in Africa and Middle East region, in Eurasia, uh, in Latin America and Caribbean, as well as North America. I'd also like to, to um, just say that these uh, regions have been uh, selected specifically based on the occurrence of geothermal resources. So this report also benefited uh, from the input of about 31 experts who are drawn from uh, 28 institutions, many of them affiliated to the Global Geothermal Alliance and others who are supporting geothermal in different ways. So I'll start by uh, first of all giving uh, an, an, an overview of uh, some of the factors that are taking place in the global energy uh, landscape that have also affected the geothermal development. One of these being energy transition. We know we are living in, in a time when we are trying to move away from fossil fuels and uh, uh, increase the deployment of renewable energy. And uh, geothermal happens to be one of these renewable energies. 
And uh, one of the key benefits of geothermal with regard to energy transition is that it gives us a base load of energy exports, which can be used to, to stabilize our electricity grids and our heat grids. Uh, another thing that also has been happening in the, in the global energy market is the, the climate change policies uh, that are shaping uh, how, we, how we, we look at the different aspects. And particularly when it comes to the energy sector, uh, we are increasingly trying to decarbonize the energy sector by increasing the deployment of renewables. And we are seeing many countries uh, also including geothermal in their nationally determined contributions as one of the ways uh, of enabling them to meet their, um, their decarbonization, uh, decarbonization agenda. And one of these countries, uh, just to give an example, is uh, Dominica that looks into um, deploying geothermal energy and uh, by this, they, they hope to reduce their uh, carbon emission by at least 90%. Then you also see countries trying to diversify their energy mix. Uh, so this is to reduce uh, over dependence on a single source of energy. Uh, and I'll give an example of Kenya, that uh, is a country that uh, for a long time had depended on hydropower for its uh, electricity needs. But because of the changes in, in, uh, in the weather patterns, in the hydrological patterns, the hydropower was not able to meet the country's electricity needs. And uh, the next available option for the country was to switch to geothermal energy. And over the last uh, uh, 30, uh, I mean, the last 20 years, we've seen that the share of electricity generated from geothermal in Kenya grow uh, currently to stand at around 45%. Uh, at the moment, we also are living in a time where we are experiencing an energy crisis that uh, began last year, driven primarily by the ongoing war in Ukraine. And uh, this has dis disrupted uh, energy markets and uh, uh, also uh, caused uh, some concern with regard to energy security. And because of these countries are looking into developing their, uh, their local energy, uh, energy sources in order to ensure that they're more energy secure. And uh, geothermal is uh, being looked at as one of the key uh, energy resources that can be able to address this particular issue. Uh, then also the need for sustainable heating and cooling, where uh, uh, countries are becoming more conscious of, on the need to um, to make their uh, to, to increase the energy efficiency in their heating and cooling sector, as well as reduce the, the carbon footprint of this sector. And we're seeing geothermal increasingly uh, uh, coming into that space. Uh, then finally, uh, governments have been putting in place a number of financial and uh, economic incentives uh, in order to support the deployment of geothermal. And this, to a large extent, has also benefited uh, benefit the geothermal industry. So I'll now uh, quickly go through um, the status of, uh, um, uh, of electricity with regard to geothermal energy. And what we've been seeing over the past few years is that renewables have increasingly outpaced the non-fossil fuels, I mean, the, the fossil fuels in terms of the installed capacity for electricity. And uh, over the last uh, few, few years, um, uh, this has been a, a constant trend. When you, when you look at last year alone, uh, renewables accounted for about 83% of the new renewable energy capacity, uh, which were, was a total of two, 295 gigawatts. But of these, may, most of it, about 90% was obtained from solar and wind. And only about one, 186 megawatts was obtained from geothermal energy. Uh, now, when we compare geothermal energy and the other renewable energy solutions, we see that geothermal uh, contributes only about 0.5% of the installed capacity for um, electricity globally. And uh, this represents about uh, 16 gigawatts of electricity, of, uh, electricity being generated from geothermal as of uh, 2021. In terms of how this has been growing, uh, we see between uh, 2000 and 2021, uh, geothermal has grown at a rate of about 3.5% per year. But over the last uh, few years, between 2015 to 2021, uh, there was a slight increase uh, of about 5% per year. Now, in terms of uh, regional um, uh, distribution of geothermal uh, electricity development, we see that about 30 countries currently are producing electricity from geothermal uh, And uh, there are about five countries that have attained one gigawatt of geothermal electricity. This include the United States, Indo 
Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Turkey, and, uh, and New Zealand. Uh, then we also have other five countries that also have some substantial geothermal uh, resources that, that have been deployed for electricity generation, including Mexico, uh, Italy, Kenya, uh, Japan, and, and Iceland. But overall, what we've been seeing is that over the last 20 years, most of the geothermal uh, electricity deployment has been uh, driven by, by activities in Turkey, in, in Indonesia, Kenya, New Zealand, and uh, the USA. Uh, in terms of the regions, uh, Asia and uh, uh, the Oceania region has the highest uh, installed capacity of electricity, followed by the North America, most of it, which is in the United States, and then uh, uh, followed by Europe. In terms of uh, geothermal heating, um, so we realize that the heating sector is the largest end use sector uh, uh, that takes about 50% of all the energy that's generated today. Uh, but unfortunately, most of this heat is generated from uh, fossil fuels and uh, traditional, uh, uh, I mean, and, and from traditional biomass. And only about 10% uh, of uh, the heat is generated from renewable energy sources. Uh, and geothermal accounts for only about 0.3% of the renewable, um, uh, of the share of, of, of renewable heat. Uh, when it comes to, when you look specifically like geothermal energy, what you realize is that most of the heat uh, from geothermal is being used uh, with, uh, with uh, heat pumps, which account for about 72% of uh, geothermal heating and cooling applications. Uh, this is followed by uh, space heating, mainly through district heating system, as well as individual heating, uh, that use the, the geothermal water uh, this, uh, at about 12%, and uh, another 11% used for bathing and swimming. And the remaining 3.5% is mainly for um, agri food and industry applications. Uh, in terms of the regional distribution, again, Asia takes the largest share of the installed capacity for geothermal heating. Uh, at around 43%, followed by, by Europe and then by United States. And then we see uh, Latin America and the Caribbean and African Middle East uh, taking less than 1% of the installed capacity for geothermal heating. In terms of growth uh, over the years, uh, between 2000 and 2020, uh, there's an increase of 10.3% uh, per year. And between 2015 to 2020, an increase of about 8.9% per year. So a slight increase, I mean, a slight decrease um, over the last few years. Now I'm going to go through some of the challenges that uh, have uh, hindered and accelerated the uh, development of geothermal uh, resources. And uh, one of the main limitations is uh, regarding limited awareness about the opportunities, as well as limited uh, knowledge about um, the benefits of geothermal uh, development. Uh, another thing is regarding the uh, resistance to uh, uh, the development of geothermal resources by the local people, by the indigenous communities, as well as by uh, some organizations that we have concerns regarding geothermal. And uh, what we see that most of this resistance is brought about by uh, conflict on the, on the use of land. Uh, it's also brought about by limited knowledge about the risks that are associated with geothermal and the mitigation measures that have been put in place to address uh, those, uh, those risks. Uh, it could also be due to particular environmental risks associated with geothermal development. Uh, other challenges are related to the market conditions. And what we see is that in some uh, markets, uh, the electricity markets where the, the, uh, the, the markets are regulated, uh, we find that the tariffs that are existing sometimes may not be very uh, attractive for the development of geothermal uh, because uh, the, those tariffs uh, are mainly based on the, on the cost of electricity, but they do not take into consideration other factors such as the, the, the high capacity factor that can be provided by uh, technologies such as geothermal. Uh, we've also been seeing some delays in the development of power purchase agreements in some markets, which have led to a delay in the uh, development of the geothermal projects, as well as limited financing in some markets due to uh, various reasons, including uh, country risk, uh, among others. 
Uh, there's also been a, an issue of technological development where scalability of geothermal has faced the challenges. And this is because the development of geothermal has mainly been concentrated in areas that uh, have um, a volcanic settings, um, as well as uh, areas that have uh, underground water resources that, that, uh, uh, that are in these uh, hot rocks. Uh, and because these are, are limited in terms of their geographical distribution, that has had a, 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 has had a negative impact on the, on the insulated development of geothermal. Then when you look at some country specific uh, uh, conditions, uh, we, we realize that some geothermal projects are located in some uh, remote areas that are hard to access. And these have prevented the development of those resources. Uh, in addition to that, some geothermal resources are located in, uh, uh, in, I mean, in an ecologically sensitive environment such as national parks and forests. And this has led to a slowdown in the development of those, those, uh, those particular geothermal resources. Uh, in some countries, again, uh, perceived political instability uh, has also been a hindrance to the development of geothermal. But despite these challenges, we've also seen some uh, enabling frameworks that have been put place in different countries that have resulted in uh, would increase in the share of geothermal in those countries. And uh, I will discuss this briefly based on three main topics. Uh, one is regarding the legal and regulatory frameworks. So what you've been seeing is an effort towards um, uh, simplifying the existing regulations uh, and also shortening the period within which projects can get permits to develop their geothermal projects. And we see countries approaching this topic in different ways. Uh, some countries have developed dedicated uh, laws and regulations that govern the geothermal sector. Uh, other countries uh, have geothermal development regulated by a number of laws that are, uh, are uh, spread across different sectors, such as the mining sector, the water resources uh, uh, sector, as well as the renewable energy sector. And yet in other countries, geothermal development is only reserved for public institutions. And, and of course, this has led to the uh, development of, of geothermal resources in different ways in those markets. Uh, then uh, some countries have also put in place some uh, enabling policies, uh, policy instruments, such as uh, uh, tax incentives. So these have particularly been very useful in countries like the, the United States, where uh, developers get uh, 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 tax credits, either for the, uh, for the equipment in order to reduce their, their capital expenditure, or in the operation uh, stage to reduce their operating expenses. In other markets, we've seen the introduction of feeding tariffs. Uh, so these are long-term contracts for, for electricity that give comfort to the investors, as well as power purchase agreements, which in many cases have been used to uh, support project developers to arrive at financial closure for their projects. We've also been seeing an increasing uh, number of countries that are developing their national uh, plans and uh, renewable energy plans, while uh, uh, incorporating the use of renewable, uh, the use of geothermal energy. And uh, what this means is that if we do not plan to have geothermal in our energy, in, in our national energy plans, then it's very difficult to have the development of geothermal taking place. Now, another instrument that has also been uh, successfully used to, to support the development of geothermal resources is the use of financial and risk mitigation instruments. Um, uh, and these ones have taken different uh, angles. Some of them are publicly uh, are financed. Others include the risk sharing uh, mechanism, uh, but also these have contributed to um, enabling the projects to have access to financing. And uh, we can see some examples of how this has helped some countries, for example, in Turkey, uh, due to the use of these policy instruments, they have been, used, they have been able to grow their installed capacity for electricity from less than 100 megawatts in 2010 to over 1,700 megawatts in 2022. The same case in the Netherlands, they've been able to uh, develop more geothermal projects that are based, uh, uh, I mean, due to the use of the uh, risk mitigation facilities. Now, I look at some of the trends that we are seeing in the industry that we think are going to uh, lead to increased deployment of geothermal. And one of them is that uh, we are seeing an increase in the development of uh, low temperature and medium temperature geothermal resources. 
So for both heating and cooling applications, as well as for electricity generation. So for heating and cooling applications, we are seeing uh, Jerome being used to heat buildings uh, in the agri-food sector, as well as in bathing and swimming. While for electricity generation, we are seeing the increase in the binary technology, which has grown from 12% uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the year 2000 to now uh, about 58% of, of the new power plants that are being developed uh, being binary power plants. And these, of course, are taking advantage of the low and medium temperature geothermal resources. And uh, they are looking beyond the volcanic uh, settings into the sedimentary basins uh, as well as the shallow, uh, the geothermal resources that they love in the shallow ground. We also seeing a trend where different technologies are being uh, developed to be able to access geothermal resources that were previously hard to access. And these include the enhanced geothermal system that includes fracturing of the underground rocks in order to increase the permeability of the flow of water uh, so that we can be able to extract more heat from, from the underground. Uh, there's also a modification of the EGS uh, of the EGS system, which is called the uh, closed loop system, where instead of fracturing the rock, a series of horizontal wells are drilled in the underground in order to be able to, 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 to access the heat from down there. There's also the supercritical um, geothermal resources, and this in, involves drilling into deep depth to access uh, resources at very high temperature. Uh, with the hope that these very high temperature uh, geothermal resources can be able to provide uh, more energy than the normal geothermal uh, wells. Another emerging trend is a cross industry uh, collaboration where geothermal and other related industries are collaborating uh, increasingly. One of the industries that where we are seeing this is in the oil and gas sector. So, oil and gas and geothermal, these are uh, industries that are closely related. In, in, uh, because they both involve drilling of the subsurface and they also have a similar expertise uh, such as the geoscientists. Um, apart from that, the geothermal, uh, I mean, the oil and gas industry, they have been doing this for a long time and they have access to a lot of data, uh, subsurface data, and this data is also very useful for the geothermal sector. And uh, we're seeing a number of projects where uh, the oil and gas sector is, is, uh, is getting involved in geothermal projects. Uh, and we're also seeing an increase in investment by the oil and gas uh, industry in the geothermal projects. Another area of cross-industry collaboration is in the area of critical minerals. And this involves the extraction of uh, minerals such as lithium from geothermal brine uh, with several projects in the US and uh, in Europe where this is already being done. Uh, finally, in the area of uh, production of green hydrogen from geothermal resources, again, uh, we are seeing projects where geothermal is being used to produce uh, uh, green hydrogen in Japan, in New Zealand, as well as in, in Iceland. Another trend is an increase in uh, international cooperation, whereby uh, different players are coming together to try and address the multidimensional problems that uh, are uh, facing the geothermal industry. Um, and this collaboration involves uh, mainly sharing of global best practices, building of technical capacity, as well as advancing technolo technology and innovations. So at the global level, we, we have some platforms that are being uh, used for these uh, international collaboration, such as the uh, IGA and the GGA. Uh, at the regional level, we have, uh, again, a number of platforms, including the uh, European Geothermal Energy Council, and uh, the Africa Rift Geothermal Facility, among others. At the bilateral level, we are seeing uh, countries with the geothermal exp expertise supporting other countries that are trying to develop their, their geothermal resources, such as Japan, Iceland, and the United States and New Zealand, uh, who are going out to support other countries to develop their geothermal resources. So finally, I would like to just uh, show some, some conclusions on um, uh, some of the things that policymakers and the project developers can do in order to support geothermal development further. And one of them is that we need to focus on more, of all available geothermal resources. So not just the high temperature, but also the medium and the low, tem uh, the low temperature geothermal resources. Uh, then it's also important to work on improving the enabling frameworks uh, in order to attract investment to geothermal uh, uh, projects, and we've seen how that has supported the development of geothermal countries like Turkey and, and the Netherlands. 
And then we also need to foster cross-industry collaboration because we believe that uh, it's through cooperation that we can be able to address many of the challenges that uh, uh, the geothermal industry is facing, as well as to build on the synergies that exist between geothermal and other industries such as oil and gas and the mineral extraction. So, um, yeah, so I think that will be the end of the presentation and I welcome any questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for the insightful presentation. And to our audience, we encourage you to take advantage of the, the chat and the Q&A feature to ask any questions and or doubts uh, they might have. But I'll start with some of the questions we have received so far, and I'll try and summarize them into, uh, into two questions uh, for the time being. Uh, the first question relates to the emerging technologies that can access geothermal resources from hot dry rocks and what are the, some of the challenges um, in using these technologies? Yeah, thank you Karen for that question. So um, yeah, there are three main technologies that are being developed to access energy from the, the hot dry rocks. Uh, these include the enhanced geothermal systems, the uh, closed loop system, as well as the supercritical uh, Resources. So uh, these technologies are still at the, um, I would say, demonstration stage. Um, so they have not yet gotten to commercial uh, uh, stage where they, are, where they can be used commercially to 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 to, to generate electricity or to generate heat. Um, but the hope is that when these technologies are uh, eventually when, when eventually they become successful. It's going to support the scale up of geothermal development. So we'll be able to get access to geothermal resources, not just in areas that have um, the perfect geological conditions, but in areas where the, the heat exists. And this is anywhere in the world. Uh, now, regarding some of the challenges that these technologies are facing, um, so with regard first of all to the enhanced geothermal system, so this has been affected uh, for some time by the uh, induced seismicity, which has limited its application and actually led to uh, some projects being discontinued. Uh, when it comes to supercritical geothermal resources, so uh, it's been a bit challenging uh, uh, drilling into very hot, uh, hot rocks because the existing tools for drilling um, have not, have not advanced to the level where they can be able to, to, to drill in very high uh, temperature. As well as the tools that are being used to measure the temperatures, they they they, they could not attend, uh, withstand some of those temperatures. But uh, a lot of a lot is happening with, with regard to innovation in that in that sense, so that uh, the, the drilling tools as well as the, the instruments for measuring uh, temperature and pressure at that depth can be able to withstand those kind of temperatures. Uh, again, uh, at this very deep depth, we again get to experience the, the challenge of uh, limited permeability. Um, and, and of course, that has, that has also been hindering the, the development of geothermal resources. Thank you. Um, okay, that, that was good. Thank you so much. Um, we have we just have time for one more question, and I see there are a few more questions on the the chat and the Q and A feature. But I'll I'll stick to the one that uh, we received earlier, so that we go in chronology. Um, how is IRENA in the framework of the Global Geothermal Alliance supporting countries to increase the deployment of geothermal energy? Yes, yeah, so thank you for that uh, question again, Karen. So um, what IRENA has done is that it has established the Global Geothermal Alliance as a platform uh, for um, encouraging collaboration between the geothermal industry mm -hmm. as well as the governments. And uh, in, that, in that sense, IRENA has been uh, holding various uh, forums where it brings together these two, uh, uh, these two institutions, so the industry and the government, to exchange on the various uh, challenges that the industry is facing, as well as that's the potential solutions that, that um, uh, can be used to address those challenges. Uh, and specifically, IRENA has taken a keen interest on the use of uh, geothermal for, for heating and cooling application. And in that regard, we have developed some guidebooks 
uh, one guidebook focuses on the use of geothermal for district heating and cooling, mm -hmm. while another focuses on the use of geothermal for uh, agri-food applications. Um, and we've used this as a basis for building capacity for our stakeholders. But beyond the building capacity, we are now going into a phase where we are supporting countries to do uh, country assessments on how they can be able to use the thermal resources for heating and cooling in buildings, as well as in the agri-food sector, uh, and trying to link this to uh, project implementation so that we see an increase in the share of uh, geothermal uh, energy in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, unfortunately, our time is up for today. I would like to thank Jack for his time and for sharing his knowledge and insights on our latest work. I would also like to thank you all for joining today and for your attention and your questions. We hope you learned something new. The recordings and the slides will be posted on IUNA events website for those who have missed any part of the webinar or would want to go through it again. Um, I understand there are some questions that are still left and I, I believe Jack has shared his uh, email address if you want to reach out to him for any further clarification. I, I wish you a great rest of the day and we hope to see you soon in the upcoming webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.